in here. Usually. Hi, Hi Simona. Simona. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I got it. Oh, I'm putting up the cover slide for you. Uh, they requested it. Yeah. I'm just waiting for it to be sent to me. So. Oh, you're not going to see my email. It's going to be good. <laughs> It'll be fine. She's asking if the computer will be up there. Oh, um, I can move it over. That's fine. If you want, I, you can just uh, put it on the desk instead so you can have the podium to yourself. Yep. I'll actually just move that now. May as well. Uh-oh. Try and stick it under the podium. That might be the sure. I've got a splinter in my mm -hmm. Do you think that will fit in there? Just maybe? Yeah, I'll put it slightly. Just put that slide. I'm going to go ahead and just unhook from there. Okay. Just for a second. It'll kill the projector. Yeah. What do we want to do? Put she was going to put it in here. Oh. Just sideways. Oh, all right. So I'm just unhooking from her. Right. So and she can do so whatever she can she put needs it in to. there. Oh, okay. And I can uh, just yep. set it up once it's situated. That's just a flyer. We have a specific. Um, my e email is kaisa at umish. It's K A I S A, just my first name. Yeah, so there should be power just on the end of my extension cord up there. Okay. If you can squeeze them a little longer. Yeah, because yeah, unfortunately it's like not a long enough thing unless we pull the table closed and put it a little off. Right. I mean, we can if you want. Yeah, because I thought it was just going to be easier to temporarily, but I guess it's staying here. 
How relative your life is. How close? How far? I say let's just do Yeah, that's probably safer. A little, a little weird, but it's safer for everybody. At least we can tuck all the people. Do you need a? Do short. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. I was like, this is, she ended up not wanting to bring in their own slides or anything, so we're going to use this for the cover slide. I just meant to originally have it for testing. <laughs> Yeah, I 
know whether that was me or whether that's the way it is over here. In the Venn diagram. Yeah. Yeah. Us in some ways I think we should like at least greet people together. Welcome, everybody. We're so, so happy that you're all here. <laughs> and you are? I am Simona Golden, and I uh, direct the Teaching Works streaming seminar series. And we're just Deborah Ball, and I are just thrilled beyond belief to have finally arrived at November 18th, uh, this date that didn't have a lot of meaning to, I think, either of us until midway through the summer when we set about convincing uh, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot to come and visit us. And since that time, we've really been counting down the days until this moment. So good afternoon. It's great to see all of you, uh, those of you watching online and also all of you in the room. It's a different setting than usual, and so I almost feel like I can see you more in this new setting than in the old one. 
Um, Timon and I wanted to begin with an uh, acknowledgement of the land that we're standing on here as part of a habit of beginning to acknowledge that we're always standing on, on native land in this country. And there are lots of ways to do this and lots of sort of debates about whether this is something to do. And we're choosing to be learning about doing that in our environment. So I think many of you know, because this is, for many of you, the place that you actually live, that we've talked about this before. And this is, we're standing here on the lands of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. This is their land. This has been their land of time immemorial. It's their land going forward and acknowledging that we're always standing on that. There's a long conversation to have about what it means to be saying that, but for now, let's just say we're something we're all on a learning curve, or many of us are, to think about. It's really my great honor also to be uh, opening this year's series. We do this together, and we decided today that we would begin by introducing today's guest because the entire series this year actually grew from our enchantment with hearing uh, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot speak a couple of years ago, and we're just incredibly, incredibly honored and joyful to be creating that opportunity here in our own environment. Before I introduce her, I wanted to also read a very short um, kind of quote from a poem in the introduction to this wonderful new book by Jai Harjo, who is the current poet laureate of the United States, the first Native American poet of the United States. This book is wonderful. She's published many other collections of poetry. This is called An American Sunrise. It just came out. And I'm choosing here to read something that she quotes at the beginning of another very well-known, uh, in this case, Caribbean American poet, June Jordan. She writes at the very opening to her book, and I think it's fitting in our welcoming of you, which is why I chose it. To tell the truth is to become beautiful, to begin to love yourself, value yourself. And that's political in its most profound way. And I think part of what I find so inspiring about the opportunity to learn from you, to read you, to hear you, and to now share you with so many people in the community who all, many of them know you even better than I, um, is the ways in which you help us all see the truth and learn to value beauty and to learn things that often go invisible. I know we'll learn a lot from you this afternoon. So Darius Robinson asked me um, suspiciously why I was carrying this notebook. Uh, there's a story to why he would be suspicious about my carrying a notebook, but for now let me just say, for a long time I kept notebooks. I have recently made a transition to not so often being tied to my notebook. However, this notebook is from 2017. It's a miniature notebook, and I brought it because um, I wanted to tell you a short story that leads to my introduction. On Friday, April 28, 2017, I was in San Antonio. I think. Probably a number of you were also in San Antonio. It was the 2017 AERA annual meeting. And I was sitting on the floor near the back of an impossibly crowded room, much more crowded than this one. It was hot, there were people everywhere. I think basically to get a seat, I kind of like edged my way and I wasn't late uh, and sat kind of crunched on the floor with my backpack and my, got my notebook out. I could barely see the front of the room. But then the room grew and just completely quiet when then President Vivian Gadsden uh, got up to introduce the speaker, the room just hushed. I don't think she even did anything to get to hush, it just hushed. And she got up to introduce the speaker, the 2017 AERA Distinguished Lecturer, which is a one lecture given each year to an honored scholar, practitioner, thinker, educator in our field, and the president gets to select that person. And Vivian did us all the honor and the gift of inviting uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, and she indeed was the speaker that day. Within minutes, I was completely captivated. It didn't matter that I was completely squished, that my foot was falling asleep. It didn't matter that I could barely hold my notebook. Actually, my writing is not up to my normal, like, pristine standards of what that should look like, but it's not bad. And I hauled it out today because it brought back the memories of that day. I was literally hanging on every word. And my notes here are really interesting because they're filled with like direct language that Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot was talking to us with and the structure of the talk, which was beautifully structured, but also all these comments to myself on the side, like, oh my God, this is the most amazing talk. I don't usually write notes like that. I just write and I listen. And there's all this commentary throughout, which I won't like inflict on you, but this notebook reminds me what a moving day that was. So uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot is the Emily Hargroves Fisher Professor of Education at Harvard University, and she's many, many things, as many of you know. She's an educator, she's a researcher, an author, and a public intellectual. 
She was among many awards that she's received. She received one of the coveted MacArthur Genius Grants uh, to support the imaginative, fierce, and brave original projects of her scholarship. And I've only mentioned a small fraction of her sort of professional beings. There are many more things one could say about her, some of which I would know and some of which I would not, but others in the room might well about who she is. She's written 10 books, and each has deeply shaped our field in all different ways. I won't name them all, but if you've read, for example, The Good High School, Portraits of Character and Culture, or Worlds Apart, Relationships Between Families and Schools, but you didn't read Baum and Gilead, Journey of a Healer, which won the 1988 Christopher Award given for, and I love this, literary merit and humanitarianism, you'll want to. The Essential Conversation, What Parents and Teachers Can Learn from Each Other, another important book, and a couple are written about the relationships between families and schools. And her 1997 book, The Art and Science of Portraiture, I know is inspiring a number of you in this room who are grappling with other ways to combine the effort to combine art, aesthetics, criticism, thought together in what we mean by scholarship. And she shows us in that book the beginnings of, or maybe not the beginnings, but the development of her thinking about what it means to create portraits as a method of scholarship. Her book, Exit, The Endings That Set Us Free, given to me by our very dear Carla Shallaby, one of her amazing students, has illuminated many things about my life to me, and I think for many of us in this room. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot gives voice to the possibility and the hard work involved in hope. My respect and gratitude for all I always learn from her voice, her words, her perspective, and her elegant and passionate thinking are unending. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. And my dear colleague, Simona Golden, who will tell us a little bit about this year. Simona, please join me in welcoming. There's no sorry involved. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have these wonderful <laughs> afternoons where we get to do something as wonderful as listen oh, to Sarah. Goodness. So thank you for everything you do. It gives me an opportunity since I went first to say thank you for all that you do to make this possible, Simona. And I'll turn it over to you to frame what we're doing this year. I'm quite sure you're all noticing some trembling between Deborah and I, like trembling that we don't usually do, right? Like, I feel like a leaf in the, in the, in the breeze. Um, there are still a few leaves, even though the snow is so deep here in Ann Arbor right now, and I feel just like one of them clinging on to the, to trying to be coherent in the space of feeling such gratitude to begin this day. Um, so, as I said before, this is the, the first of the Teaching Work Streaming Seminar Series Talks of the Year. And we've taken um, directly from um, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot's talk the title, which uh, we're calling this year, Pivot Towards the Light, Challenge and Challenges of Making Justice Integral. And so hopefully many of you have been along this ride with us for many years. I, I know that I'm seeing so many faces of people who've, who've come to these uh, seminar series over the years with us. And you know that at least in the past three years, we have worked really hard to examine the entailments of teaching in ways that deliberately disrupt inequities. And we've tried to focus very carefully on nuanced, enact, nuanced enactment of high leverage teaching practice. As well, last year, um, on the special nature of knowing content and teaching and the work of seeing and the work of hearing children's ideas as they interact with subject matter. And across these handfuls of years, the scholars and the practitioners uh, with whom we've worked have consistently focused their elaborations on anti-oppressive teaching practices with examples grounded in content. And in this year, we're building on what we've done before. And we're really trying to continue with great seriousness to take on um, with urgency, the core problems of educational justice. We're drawing, as Deborah said, with deep inspiration from Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot's 2017 distinguished lecture in which she said, I'm going to quote you a little bit more, quote, rather than being consumed by the darkness, I want to pivot towards the light. I want to frame our continued and deepening work as a project of inspired creativity, a deep gesture of nuanced counterpoint. When I heard you say those, those words, it felt like such um, an incredible inspiration and a call to both continue the hard work that we're doing as well as to notice and to create with great creativity responses um, to injustice. 
And so taking inspiration from your work, we've asked all of this year's uh, series speakers three key questions. So what we've asked them are the pressing problems and challenges of making justice integral. How could we name and how can we oper operationalize these problems? And what might be ways we can and should take action on these challenges so that we can make some meaningful headway? Addressing all of these things, it will take without doubt some great audacity and a deep humility and some tireless dedication, as well as impatience and as well as urgency. We're pretty resolute with each other and hopefully you'll join us in that on keeping our eyes on societal patterns that reflect centuries of oppression and structural injustices and everyday racism and doing more than just noticing these things or just naming these things, but instead to strive to counter and to disrupt them in all of the common spaces of our work and our lives. So we're striving to not be deterred by these forces that prevent us from necessary work to do the restructuring and the re-envisioning of how we work with children, how we work with teachers in our schools, so that we can prepare and support our candidates, our teacher candidates, so that they can work skillfully and with great care with their students and to help them thrive. So we've invited this series of speakers um, to help us to keep our eye on this fight against both racism and oppression and to ask them, what is it that we must do right now and in each and every day following today to pivot towards the light? How can we act in this urgency and in solidarity to marshal our creativity and our imagination? And so we're so blessed to be beginning with you, Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, um, for having really inspired this entire series. Um, your, her talk is titled, Forging the Connections Between Learning and Justice on View and on Voice and on Visibility. Um, now switching to uh, some administration. Uh, we have a lot of people who are joining us uh, remotely. That's why we have these cameras and we're so very happy that the hundreds of you who've signed up can, um, can join us here uh, even though you're not in the room. And so what, what we're going to do is uh, Dr. Lawrence Lightfoot will speak. I invite you to keep track, to take all sorts of notes, notes like the ones that Deborah took, both the, the words that you want to remember as well as the way that they make you feel. Um, you know, note to yourself those things so that at the conclusion of um, her talk, we can come up to the, to the uh, microphone and ask questions. And the reason we encourage everybody, even the people in the room, to come up to the microphone is that we want to be as inclusive as we possibly can of the people who are not here. So it, it intercedes upon the wonderful overlapping ways we might ask questions, but it is important for making sure that the people who are not here can hear everything that we're saying and can join in themselves. And so if you're not here with us, you can email your questions to twseminar at umich.edu. You can use our uh, Twitter hashtag, which is TW Seminar, and many of you joined um, my dear colleague Alyssa Brandon in some uh, amazing conversations on Twitter just the other day, or you could post to the Teaching Works Facebook page. And with that, I am getting out of the way of our speaker and inviting her up to the podium. Thank you. Wow, I feel so appreciated and welcomed. What grace and what gratitude. Thank you so much, both of you, for this introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. I can't remember the last time I was in Detroit or even in Ann Arbor. So this is a real new experience for me. Um, I would just like to add a line before um, this, this title. Um, and the line is, there is a balm in Gilead, forging the connections between learning and justice on view, voice, and visibility. We live in treacherous and violent times, times where educators have a particular responsibility, times that demand our engagement, our courage, our rigor, and our imaginations, our sense of urgency, our solidarity. It is, in fact, impossible for us to have any conversation that refers to child rearing, teaching and learning, or educational justice 
any conversation that speaks about the human condition without our minds being flooded by the bloody images, the brutality that surrounds us every day, made overwhelmingly visible by the 24-7 media coverage and amplified by the vast web of social media. A violence that visits our daytime reveries, haunts our nightmares, a, vi a violence that terrorizes our children, attacks our bodies and minds, sends toxins into an atmosphere of fear. We are racked by the carnage which seems to have become the new normal, even as we notice its deepening corrosive impact on our lives. We are racked by the ugly, mean-spirited, and relentless shadow boxing of too many political leaders filled with obscenities, phobias, lies, bereft of content and moral anchoring. Racked by the open hunting season on unarmed young black men, the murders of Trevon Martin and Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, and a parade of others stand as symbols of the terror all, all us black mothers feel as our sons walk out the door on any ordinary morning. We are pained by the ambush and carnage of nine black worshipers in a mother church in Charleston, by the slaughtering of five and six-year-olds in their classroom at the Sandy Hook Elementary School by the gunning down of 49 revelers in a, gay revelers in a queer bar in Orlando, Florida, by the killing of 11 congregants worshiping in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. We are horrified by the violence against brown refugees seeking asylum at our borders, by the brutal family separations and the caging and abuse of their children. We are distressed by the violence against our earth our air, our oceans, our forests, our rivers, ruining our planet for the next generation. We are racked by the sexual assaults on college campuses, in the military, in the film and media industries, and among players in the National Football League, where the institutional responses have been mostly opaque, inadequate, and irresponsible. Amidst the terror and tragedy, the fears, and the tears, the confusion and the cacophony. There are glimmers of light, signs of hope and strength that reflect brave people's efforts to bring out change, to bring about change, their unwillingness to become tortured victims, their agency and anger, their solidarity. The Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements are emblematic of the emerging courageous collectivities that have colored and covered our political and cultural landscapes. Even more amazing are the young people's brigades, millions marching around the globe for gun control and combating climate change. The sustained demonstrations by high school and college students risking everything in their protest for freedom and democracy in Hong Kong. Lifting up their voices, warning and chastising their elders, speaking truth to power, providing political and moral leadership. The youthful protests are promising and catalyzing, the young boldly leading the way, but their actions also cause the corruption of the elders making to seem grotesque and irresponsible. The symbolism and reality of these myriad and violent assaults taken individually and collectively make us feel helpless hopeless and vulnerable. Our tears express our deepest anguish, fears, confusion, and rage. Our democratic values and civil rights seem to be crumbling around us as we work to find our spiritual and moral anchors. In our adult confusion and impotence, we struggle with finding the right words to support and guide our children and our students. Guidance for which we must take responsibility but a guidance that requires seeing young people as allies, activists, and agents of their own just mercy. During these times of acute anxiety about our fragile and troubled world, we educators, our society's public adults, feel a particular challenge and responsibility to take care of the young people in our charge, to hear and heed their voices of witness and warning to find a precarious balance between mourning 
and moving on, between revenge and reconciliation, between grieving and getting busy. This afternoon, I want to address my comments to researchers and practitioners, scholars and activists, and to those who sit on the boundary lines between these domains. To all of us who are focused on finding ways to forge the connection between education and justice. But this afternoon, rather than being consumed by the darkness, in the words of this year's theme for the Teaching Works series, I want to pivot towards the light. And I will repeat myself and Serena, uh, Simona. I want to frame our continuing and deepening work as educational researchers, as practitioners, as a project of inspired creativity, a deep gesture of nuanced counterpoint by fostering, offering three challenges to the prevailing language, metaphors, and images that tend to dominate the public dialogues about education and schooling. I fear that as our society and our schools have become increasingly diverse, as the distance between rich and poor continues to widen, the definitions of achievement have grown narrower and more exclusive. At a time when educational cultures need to reflect the plurality of voices, stories, and cultural narratives, a variety of intelligences and identities, and a spirit of inquiry, criticism, and adventure, many researchers, educators, and policymakers have retreated to a view of achievement that is narrow and monolithic. How might we help to create school cultures from early childhood classrooms through graduate training that forge the connections between excellence and equity, learning and justice, disciplined inquiry, and truth-telling? I want to make three modest, ambitious, and intertwined suggestions, all beginning with V. The first has to do with reframing our view. The second centers on the need to lift up our voices. And the third expresses an imperative that everyone in our schools, every child, every student, every teacher, feel seen and known, that everyone be visible. Three V's, view, voice, and visibility. I believe that each of these V's offers a reframing of our perspective that challenges the habits and rhetoric, the hopelessness and inaction that too often dominate educational discourses, particularly those discourses that focus on the tangled ideation and seemingly intractable barriers to educational equality. So I want to begin with re reframing our view on goodness. Social scientists have a long legacy of focusing their investigations on pathology and disease rather than on health and resilience. And their stance has traditionally been one of studying down, investigating and probing the lives of people who are other, people who are poor and colored, people who are un undereducated and marginalized. Sitting on their distant academic perch, these scholars of what one of my colleagues calls imperial social science often confuse difference with deviance or difference with dysfunction, conflating illness and identity. This intellectual habit is magnified in research on schooling where investigators have been much more vigilant in documenting failure than they have been in describing examples of success. To some extent, the focus on pathology is understandable, often strategic, maybe even laudable. If we can identify the roots of the disease, we may be able to find a cure. Admittedly, in some recent social science scholarship, we have seen some change in perspective and perch, with researchers honoring difference and variation and documenting strength and resilience in communities once maligned and diminished. But their voices of counterpoint do not represent the norm in social science. 
I believe the relentless scrutiny of failure that continues to dominate our educational discourses has many distorting results. First, we begin to get a view of our schools and the communities they serve that magnifies what is weak and wrong and neglects evidence of promise and potential. We create a narrative that describes an educational system in a steady state of decline. Second, this focus on failure and pathology can often lead to despair, a nagging cynicism and inaction. Why should we pour our energy and resources into seeking a remedy to problems that are resistant to change and improvement? And why should we continue to suffer our own feelings of inadequacy, our own narcissistic injuries, when our efforts seem to make little difference? If things are really that bad and there's no hope for change, then why should we even try to do anything to remedy them? Third, the documentation of pathology often bleeds into blaming the victim. It lands heavily on the shoulders of those who are most oppressed and disenfranchised, those who do not have access to the halls of power and decision making, those who have no voice or visibility in the public debates about their fate. I believe that those of us who are committed to improving schools then must of course admit the huge challenges we all face in making them productive and nurturing environments. We must shake our fist and raise our voices in opposition to the pervasive inequalities and injustices. Our resistance and rage shows we care. And we must translate our outrage into sustained commitment, rigorous research, strategic action, and determined advocacy. But we must also search out the goodness in educational settings. If we begin by asking the question, what is good here? What is working well? What is strong? What is worthy? We will discover a different reality. We may even uncover a lever for change, a spark of promise that had been formally obscured by our well-worn negative prophecies. By goodness, I do not mean that we should romanticize or idealize the work of educators or mask their flaws and imperfections, or that we should ignore the powerful systemic and structural forces that impede productive educational reform. Rather, we need to use a lens that is both generous and discerning, both tough and forgiving. We must develop a way of seeing the inevitable two-ness of life, the fundamental dualisms, the in-between spaces that are, threatened, that are threaded through life experiences, the beautiful, ugly, nasty, nice ambiguities, the resilience amidst the suffering, the agency that resists victimization. We must adopt a perspective that admits the inevitable weaknesses and vulnerabilities embedded in any good enterprise. And when we find goodness in all of its fullness and complexity, we must invent ways of documenting it so that the principles and lessons of goodness might be reinterpreted and embedded in other places. I remember the impulse that I had 35 years ago when I designed a piece of research with the intention of helping to change the tone and tenor of the conversation about our nation's high schools, a conversation that had grown cynical and complaining, narrow and judgmental, a conversation that felt self-defeating in its fatalism. In April of 1983, a nation at risk, a report from the National Commission on Excellence in Education was published with great fanfare lots of clamorous uproar. The report's soundbite conclusions quickly became absorbed and imprinted in, the public, in a public looking to blame schools for what they saw as their chronic failure in educating and socializing our young. There were certainly a lot of things cited in the report that deserved critique and scrutiny. The alarming proportion of students who were graduating from high school illiterate the rampant problems of authority and discipline in schools, 
the lack of coherence and rigor in the curriculum, the widening gap of resources, opportunity, and achievement between rich and poor communities. But the report piled on in a way that was blanket and dismissive, claiming to offer an objective and measured appraisal of public schooling in America, the nation at risk was on close inspection, actually filled with accusation and vitriol, insisting that schools were solely at fault for the state of our deteriorating society and saddling schools with the primary responsibility for rebuilding a healthy, wholesome democracy. But more troubling than the vitriol, I believe, was the nostalgia that reached through the pages of the document, a nostalgia that idealized the American past and rendered the contemporary scene ugly and vapid by contrast. Looking through rose-colored glasses, the nation at risk painted a picture of a time in our history when families were stable and children were good and respectful, when teachers were devoted and communities revered them. It was a view of our past shadowed by a history of amnesia, a distortion of an American past that was, has actually never been stable or peaceful, a history that has always been chronically fragmented and changing, a history in which each generation laments the deteriorating values and irresponsible behaviors of the next one. Against this backdrop of ahistoricism, accusation, and disappointment, and the always persistent social scientific preoccupation with pathology, in my book, The Good High School, published in 1983, I hope to offer a counterpoint and challenge to the monotone of negativism. For three years, I traveled around the country documenting the character and culture of six high schools, two urban schools in poor communities, two affluent suburban schools, and two elite preparatory schools that express their goodness in very different ways, seeking to understand the sources of their stability and resilience, the arc of their institutional growth, and hoping to uncover the threats of inertia and resistance that compromise their brave efforts. In searching for the good, I was eager to hear the voices and insights, the perspectives and experiences of the school's inhabitants, not the distant appraisals of, school, of experts and researchers. I wanted to produce a document that was informative and inspiring to educators, a portrayal of their lives and work with which they could feel identified, challenged, and implicated. My own methodological invention of portraiture a bridging of empiricism and aesthetics has been a purposeful effort to document goodness and to spread the good news. It has been a quest for something missing from a good deal of scholarship in the social sciences that is steeped in positivist impulses and protocols, a quest blending science and art, expressivity and restraint, a quest full of listening and witness listening to the sound of a human voice making sense of other human voices, especially those that have been silenced and muted, often not heard, tracing the line of the story set in historical context, placing the actors in a long-running moral and political drama, producing a text that reveals the eclecticism of method and material, a narrative that reaches out to broad and diverse audiences in language that is accessible and evocative, that seeks to inform, inspire, and provoke thought and action, that speaks to the heart and the head, and in the end, hoping to build a broader community of participants who might become more fully engaged in efforts to improve the educational project. Are you with me? Okay. I need to hydrate myself. The passion has parched me. The passion has parched me. I chose the water that would match my outfit. Second V, 
lifting up our voices on discourse. This more generous and forgiving vision, this probing for goodness, is related to my second theme, which challenges the tone, dynamics, and language of the public discourse about education. Too much of the conversation about schools is reductionistic and rhetorical, driven by ideology rather than insight, and pitched to advantage particular constituencies of powerful adults rather than for the benefit of all children. It is an unruly discourse resonating with the voices of researchers and policymakers whose perspectives are often distant from the reality of life in schools. The voices of policy folks tend to be combative and expedient, while the voices of researchers too often seem opaque and remote. I am urging the development and amplification of voices that bridge the great divide between theory and practice, that take advantage of the different perspectives of researchers and practitioners, that recognize the richness of the counterpoint that gets produced when disciplined inquiry is grounded in and shaped and constrained by the social and historical context. This means, of course, that we need to dismantle the hierarchy between, between thinkers and doers, the intellectuals and the activists, and create a symmetry of voices that values each perspective. We must listen, for example, to the intimate knowledge of teachers, a knowledge that grows out of subjectivity, intuition, direct experience, and deep reflection, a knowledge that is forged out of autobiographical roots, developmental history, and personal perspective, a knowledge that is often best captured in images, metaphors, and vivid storytelling. And let us not forget the wise, authoritative, and critical voices of students, so often silenced in the discourse, so attentive to the adult hypocrisies and contradictions, so ready to teach us about the beat of contemporary culture. At the same time, we must honor the intelligence and insights of researchers whose stance must be vigilantly counterintuitive, skeptical, and enough distant from the action to be able to see patterns and trends. We must be ready to reckon with the researchers' evidence that surprises us, challenging our long-held presumptions and prejudices. I believe that the public debates around education will only be fully productive when we listen for and honor all of these voices. And when, by creating this great cacophony, we begin to speak to larger, more eclectic audiences. Rather than a dialogue informed by expediency and ideology, we will be able to develop a language that is understandable, not exclusive or esoteric, a language that encourages people to join in the conversation, provokes debate, and invites reflection and action. Joseph Featherstone, a social historian and engaged ed educator, traces the connection between the intimate storytelling of practitioners and the public discourse that researchers hope to impact, and draws the continuum between analysis and solidarity. What he calls a people's scholarship is rooted in explicitly humanistic values, honors the intertwined truths of analysis and solidarity, and can, he claims, be traced back to the great works of William James and W.E.B. E. Du Bois. It is a scholarship that embraces both analytic rigor offering a perch and perspective that is intentionally discerning, rigorous, data-filled, and distant, and community building, nourishing connections of trust and intimacy with the people we are studying and seeking to understand. It is, says Featherstone, quote, in quest of the power that comes from looking beyond the isolation at the little difference there is between humans and the supreme importance of that difference. It searches for the energizing shock of sympathy and of human community, end quote. In Souls of Black Folk, for example, W.E.B. Du Bois was at work on a problem of human blindness, linking the public existence of the Negro 
to the inner world behind the veil and offering a new kind of scholarship in which scientific facts gathered in the field would give voice to a people's existence. He was the quintessential boundary crosser. Everything was grist for Du Bois's mill, from autobiography to history, from politics to journalism to psychology, from fiction to poetry to spirituality. In constructing a rich text of objectivity and advocacy, Du Bois unmasked and interrogated the negative white images of the lives of black folk. This slender and powerful volume, Du Bois is best known, became a kind of scholarly poem, a dawning and opening for blacks, a potential vantage point for envisioning a different American culture. And interestingly, an unforgettable autobiography, Du Bois sketching himself as a teacher in a rural black school. You have to love that book. So I hope that we, in our scholarship and practice, will disrupt the discourse and reframe the conversation. That we will resist the hierarchies of power and language that get in the way of authentic and inclusive representations of a humanistic education. And that we will challenge the disciplinary boundaries and theoretical grids that inhibit our tackling of the naughty, nuanced questions that resist easy measurement. I hope that our, in, that our public and private discourses will embrace the dialectic between analysis and solidarity and create the moral and social spaces for our imaginations to soar. Such an important word here as we hope imaginations, too seldom used in our discourses about education, the processes or the content. Are you with me? Yes. Thank you. Last V, third V, making everyone visible on diversity. A real solidarity rooted in intimacy and connection grows out of authentic inclusivity, not clannishness. My third theme expresses my belief that diversity, variety, and contrast are central ingredients of educational goodness. Education must not be a monolithic experience. It must honor the differences in culture, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation, even as it searches for universal values. Students and teachers should be challenged to consider alternative ways of being, different ways of thinking, and contrasting value systems. This, of course, means more than counting bodies. The numbers of blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asians on the faculty or in the student body. A body count that no longer makes sense when so many of the bodies refuse to accept the social constructs that do not represent them or mirror their identities. It means more than scheduling rituals and celebrations to honor high holy days or revered cultural heroes. And it means more than making sure that every cultural or religious group gets visibly reflected in the curriculum. The real challenges of diversity are subtle and complex. Their very subtlety is menacing. These challenges reside in the substance and texture of discourse, in the feelings of engagement embedded in teaching and learning, in seeking to create an environment in which no one will have to endure the distortions of tokenism or feel responsible for representing a monolithic group, where people will feel safe in expressing opposing views and will learn to risk discomfort and vulnerability on the way to genuine understanding. The enactment of diversity is tremendously important as our country grows increasingly multicultural and as our world becomes smaller and smaller. When boundaries are erased and home is no longer geographically circumscribed. But instead of embracing the rich variation around us, I see a rising tendency towards clannishness that has reached a deafening crescendo in the last few years. 
and us against them mentality, a ridiculously unfair combat between the 99% and the 1%. I see a retreat from the social commitments we fought so hard for in the last few decades that troubles and terrifies me. I see it in city schools where middle-class abandonment has left our schools poor and colored. I see it in the masked messages and subtext hiding behind our policy and rich discor research discourses about achievement and opportunity gaps. Standard, uh, and I see it in the language hiding behind conversations about standards and standardization, accountability, and regulation. I see it in the wasteful wars between charter school advocates and public school defenders. I see it in the residential segregation and the gated communities that symbolize exclusion and hierarchy, in the immigration wars and the literal and symbolic walls that we erect between outsiders and insiders. I see it in the dismantling of affirmative action programs in colleges and universities and a Supreme Court willing to reconsider their legitimacy. I see it in who gets trapped on the other side of the digital divide. In this climate of prejudice and exclusivity, we who claim to welcome diversity in all of its varied manifestations, we will have to fight for this worldview in the educational institutions we attend, in the communities we inhabit, in the scholarly enclaves where we work, in the research questions and methodologies that we design. We will have to argue that pluralism brings a richness, a colorfulness, and a vitality that closed communities can never know. We will have to convince others that places that exclude are impoverished, places that inhibit the full range of learning, growth, and diversity. Diversity and authentic inclusivity, I believe, are primarily about visibility, the third V. Visibility is not about overexposure, not about being identified as the exception, not about standing apart or standing above and not about representing the race. Rather, visibility is about everyone feeling seen, everyone feeling acknowledged, and everyone being seen as worthy. I will never forget one morning when my now 37-year-old daughter, Tolani, was about four. She woke me up singing her version of Stevie Wonder's soulful anthem. You are so beautiful to me. Transposing the words and refocusing the light, tiny Tolani crooned her sweet little girl rendition. I am so beautiful to you. <laughs> she sang as she spread her arms wide and embraced the world around her. Yes, Talani, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and those eyes are more likely to see beauty if they belong to a person who herself feels beautiful. To see and feel beauty, we must be visible. Visibility is, of course, the opposite of invisibility. In the always painful opening paragraphs of Ralph Ellison's classic book, Invisible Man, published more than half century ago. The protagonist's words resonate with the emptiness and humiliation of being unnoticed, unseen. I read the opening paragraph. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, 
distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me." End quote. The plight of Ellison's invisible man echoes in our lives today. Our images continue to be distorted by what Ellison describes as the construction of their inner eyes. The prejudice of invisibility still lingers on. Ralph Ellison's notion of the construction of their inner eyes speaks to researchers, I believe, with particular poignancy. It provokes us to ask ourselves what might get in the way of our seeing others, whose lives we are documenting, whose minds we are mining and measuring, whose beliefs we are interpreting with fullness and clarity, unencumbered by the shadows of bias, prejudice, ignorance, and fear. How can we cut through the layers of hard, distorted glass and see the full humanity of our research subjects, participants, and protagonists? How can we use our methods and our metrics, our concepts and our theories, our analyses and our insights to illuminate rather than obscure the visibility of their lives? We can start, I believe, by interrogating the autobiographical roots and impulses and the intellectual preoccupations and curiosities that motivate and shape our own research. We can puncture and complicate our scholarly claims of pure objectivity, a mask we wear that too often impedes our efforts to join empathy and empiricism, sympathy and skepticism, analysis and solidarity. A mask that ultimately hides our visibility, mutes our voices, and hinders our efforts to develop symmetric relationships of respect and trust with those we are studying, with our partners in the struggle for educational justice. I worked so hard on those last two paragraphs. You know what I mean? I, I, reading back, how important are words and how important it is to really try to communicate what we're thinking and feeling. To be visible, we must live lives of vigilant observation, criticism, and action. To be seen, we must see. Observation and criticism must become daily habits of our lives as educators as practitioners and researchers, as advocates and analysts, as we test the moral threads of our society, as we rage against and study the roots of powerlessness, injustice, and oppression in Ferguson, Missouri, in Charleston, South Carolina, in Orlando, Florida, in Chicago and Baltimore, in Columbine, in Sandy Hook, in Parkland, in Syria, Gaza, in Afghanistan, in the Ukraine, in Nigeria, in North Korea. As we support fairness and justice everywhere, goodness in education means learning to risk visibility. It means learning to bear public witness. My words this afternoon, and thank you for your attentive listening. I can see it in your faces. My words this afternoon sound serious and weighty as I pivot towards the light and urge us to complicate and broaden our view of educational goodness. As I urge us to honor and acknowledge the perspectives and voices of researchers and advocates, teachers and students, and develop a broader, more inclusive conversation, one that builds the bridges between knowledge and action as I urge us to see diversity as a strength and work towards its realization in the institutions and communities we inhabit. As I urge us to make ourselves and others visible, bearing witness and speaking out. To some extent, these are all countercultural admonitions, ways of being and seeing, engaging and enacting that will be difficult to sustain 
in a society filled with conflicting tendencies. They will require disrupting the discourse and reframing the conversation. There will be dissent, conflict, and struggle as we go forth and engage the struggle. Confronting institutional structures that inhibit access, challenging the stereotypes and discrimination that render too many people voiceless and invisible, scrutinizing the cultural priorities that reinforce fierce competition and the harsh paradigm of winning and losing, and exposing the historical narratives that haunt our contemporary efforts to build a democratic nation. This is big work. This is intellectually discerning and methodologically rigorous work. This is ethical and relational work. This is passionate, soulful work. And this is work that we must do together in solidarity, with optimism, with hope, and with respect, with restraint and intentionality, with grit and with grace. I want to close with an autobiographical reflection that gestures towards themes that have motivated my scholarship for the last four decades, and that echoes with the challenges and commitments suggested by the three framing themes of view, voice, and visibility. It is carried in music, in the song my father and mother would sing to me and my siblings at bedtime that offered us comfort and solace protection from the cruelty, ignorance, and violence raging around us. The song that I would eventually sing to my own children, and now my grandchildren, when I'm lucky enough to tuck them into bed. The song sung across generations is itself a story of reframing, a gentle and brave effort to pivot towards the light, a kind of shift from seeing only suffering to seeing hope and possibility. The text is originally taken from a passage in Jeremiah, where ravaged by war, famine, and illness, the people of Gilead ask, how can I bear my sorrow? I am sick at heart. I am wounded at the sight of my people's wound. I go like a mourner overcome with horror. Is there no balm in Gilead? No physician there. Why has no skin grown over their wound? The Negro spiritual taken from the Jeremiah text gives us a transfigured view, a reframing that offers solace, hope, and promise. It transforms tragedy into a triumph of the soul. It assumes that healing will always, always leave deep scars. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Thank you. So I'm open for comments, questions, hope. Yes, New York, Sarah. 
I think you have to, if you will, for the people outside this room. Well, I don't, I don't know what the time frame is. I think that the way to begin to see change is to recognize that it's inevitably incremental, right? Um, and that it doesn't move in a linear fashion. It is at best cyclical, but sometimes it's just two steps forward and three steps back. Um, and so if we are trying to judge it by years, by chronology, right, and by years, or if we're taking um, sort of measurements of it in a linear way, then we're likely to be completely devastated and feeling hopeless. If, on the other hand, we recognize this iterative quality, the subtlety and complexity of it, um, if we look back to the lives of our parents and our grandparents, we certainly recognize we certainly recognize, however ugly it is now and devastating and frightening, it's not the way it was for my grandparents in the deep south in Mississippi. It just isn't. Or their parents, or even my parents. Um, and so I think, I think that the measurement has to, has to really include all those kinds of um, kind of strange dynamic metrics. Um, I also said earlier when I was being interviewed um, um, by Lisa here earlier that um, I think there is a whole lot, I think that educators, practitioners, and researchers are not allowed to be cynical if we, if we are being the professionals that we should be. In other words, cynicism is, is, is shouldn't be even in our vocabulary because we need to hold out hope and promise for all of the children out there. So, and I believe that if I think about myself and my own human development, that hope I see as a discipline that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a discipline I've worked on and it, and it moves with the other thing I'm, pr I'm proud about in me now which is restraint. You know, I'm just not out everywhere screaming and yelling. I really am thoughtful and strategic and careful um, about what I say and how I say it and um, what I do and how I do it. And, and I think, so that whole thing about intention, hope requiring intentionality, lack of cynicism, you know, and a discipline, I think, are, are all part of it. Yeah. I'm looking out at some of my former students who are now fancy professors here. It's so exciting. But thank you so much for coming for your talk. I always have so many questions to ask you. I'm thinking about one that I feel like I've always wanted to ask you about goodness. Um, because for me, this is one of the most important pieces of your work. And I really try to bring it into all of my research and all of my teaching and all elements of my life. Um, and I guess it's about how do you approach the boundaries of goodness sometimes? Do you ever feel like you enter spaces or interact with people and 
feel so overwhelmed by frust so overwhelmed by frustration, by feelings of frustration that you can't find the goodness. Um, and so I'm, I'm asking this question because I feel like I'm, I'm hitting some of those walls myself in some spaces, and I know that my students are as well, and I think one of, the, one of the challenges I have as a faculty member is helping them see the importance of maintaining that lens on goodness and that critical work requires that, that piece. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about how difficult that work is and the kind of affective experience as well as these other dimensions that you, you've brought in. Thanks. So that's Michelle, right? <laughs> who was one of my star students at Harvard and who keeps on asking questions, hard questions. Uh, um, I guess the first thing I would say, I always say, and I mean, which is that in pursuit of goodness, as we seek, search out and seek to document goodness, this does not mean that we are there with rose-colored glasses, with any kind of idealization, with any kind of nostalgia, um, and that, and the second thing I would say is that in any good enterprise there are weaknesses and dysfunction and imperfection. And interestingly enough, Michelle, that sometimes with me it is those places that are imperfect, that are weak, that, is dis that are dysfunctional that I feel a particular connection to. I know that in me, right? And it resonates with me. The good things aren't the only ones that resonate with me. I was, I was um, speaking with someone just yesterday as part of a project that I'm doing. And she was expressing a trait that she feels about herself, that she feels embarrassed by, not good about. And she began to talk about her jealousy. You know, that, she's, that this is one of the ways in which she leads into the world. She's jealous of others. Um, she's jealous of her friends. She's jealous of her man and his life and all of that. And there was, and there was something about the way she talked about it that I felt, you know, that I could totally understand. This is something, not because that's a that's a, a major quality in me, but because I've known it. I've, I've experienced flashes of that. I know that. And part of the, and, and our focusing on that then allowed her to, to sort of see the ways in which she's compensating and what she's compensating for. And also some of the other incredibly strong things that are part of her identity. Um, you heard me bragging about that part of me that I like now, my restraint, right, and my discipline in the sense of hope. I think it's very important when you're talking to someone that, and you hear the glimmers of something strong, even if it presents itself in some strange, slightly opaque ways, that you draw that out, you bring it out, and you give it back to them. Um, that's extremely important. And then the other thing is, you, I can go for days and weeks in conversations with people and in interviews and only hear what I feel is sad news, uh, um, powerlessness, right? Um, even something like depression. And I can go during that and, and I still will believe that there's something strong and good there. There's something resilient. There's something to be uncovered. And it always is. I'm waiting for it. I'm not pushing it. I'm not insisting. I'm waiting for it. Um, it's just so important that you don't see goodness as calm, uh, you know, kind of peaceful, placid state of mind. Goodness is from my point of view, kind of edgy and often disrupted, you know, and unstable. And it's like, you know, like we all are. And so, anyway, those are some random thoughts.
Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm only bringing my computer because the goodness of my brain while I'm working on my dissertation is disintegrating daily. And I wasn't sure if I could carry my thought from there to here. So um, there's that. So you mentioned, which really struck me, um, this idea of not under the, the um, umbrella of view and seeing goodness, not confusing difference with deviance or dysfunction, and then this is the part that struck me, or confuse illness with identity. Um, and that struck me because I do historical work in um, pre-Brown schools, Rosenwald schools in the South. Mm -hmm. And I attended, on the flip side, I attended schools in the North that were de facto segregated. It wasn't mm -hmm. probably until late high school that I experienced an integrated school. Mm -hmm. And even then I felt that that space had things that served my identity, like a gospel choir or you know, a certain amount of friends and different cultural things that we could do in school. Mm -hmm. But now um, I have a 14 year old who's in a middle school and just with research and work here, increasingly I experience schools as completely white spaces um, where a lot of, at least with kids I come into contact, it seems like they can't fully express their identity because there's no portal upon which to do that. Like Double Dutch is gone or the gospel choir is gone or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know other, but these things are gone. And so I wanted to um, hear you talk more about this idea of illness versus identity in terms of being seen and how might we as researchers or school advocates begin to maybe help schools think about the kind of quiet ways in which kids are being plucked apart because they can't be seen in their own ability to be themselves and exercise that. Like if you imagine the games that kids play or even the excitement that they may bring or style or whatever it is, um, it's kind of being wiped out of these spaces from what I'm seeing. So mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. You didn't need your computer, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Just> my blank. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that um, one of these sort of pseudo-scientific progress metrics that we have going on in schools and outside of schools is putting people into illness categories um, and then prescribing their identity to that, right? So I mean, um, and it can be anything like ADD or ADHD or anything uh, that's visible or even those things that are not visible as difference. They are then seen as dysfunctional um, or deviant or as if it's disease. So all I'm saying here is that there needs to be a way in which teachers in particular, because they're the teachers are on the front line, can begin to get rid of, of whatever that shadow is that is this category of illness, or prescribed illness, prescribed illness, or identified illness, um, and see the person who's complicated and of which, of who, and of many many parts, see that person and make that person visible and worthy. I don't quite get the connection connection between that and gospel choir and double dutching, except that schools as cultures need to be places that resonate with the roots and backgrounds and art and experience of the kids who are there mm -hmm. and allow them to hang on to those parts of their identity and to shine through those things because they are particularly great at those things, right? Mm -hmm. um, to shine out. So I think that this, this has both to do with the teachers making all students visible and making students feel seen and visible and worthy. 
and then something about school culture um, as a whole. Um, I think there's a talk about a discipline and a rigorous reflection. There's a way in which teachers need to know themselves very well. Um, uh, it's so, so important for my, you know, that we, I mean, I, on purpose, I ended with a deep autobiographical experience that I've had that has, I hoped you would then put together, has very much to do with the way I see the world as a researcher, right? And it includes music, right? It includes the feeling of what it, of, of my father and my mother singing me to sleep at night, and the feeling and the privilege of singing this same song to my grandchildren, right? Um, I, I, as I get older and older, I become more and more aware of how this autobiographical story has great implications to the way I not only see the world, but the way I document it and the way I speak about it, the language I use, the modalities that are available to me. And I, and, and, you know, so this is very, very important, not only in a researcher practice, but in teaching practice, you know. Um, and I don't think you can, to see you must be seen. Right? To see beauty, you must yourself feel beautiful. You know, and I don't think that that's going to happen until teachers, and I think this, is, this can be trained. I mean, this is not, this is a practice. This is a discipline. It's rigorous. It's tough. But it is a reflective practice that I think can be learned even late. Um, but teachers need, I think, to do that as well. I remember talking to you, I think. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think you came to talk to me. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you again. Hi. Um, I have a question from someone who's viewing online. Okay. Um, and you kind of, this is a nice transition because you, you're, the last part of your answer just kind of touched on it. Um, they say, to be able to see goodness, I feel like you need to draw from somewhere. You see beautiful if you feel beautiful. Where do you personally draw from for this work? Oh, I'm just surrounded by beauty all the time. <laughs> no, I am. Um, my life is rich with beauty, right? Um, and I, the only reason I like my, my phone is to take pictures of these moments, you know, of a beautiful uh, flower on the table, one, right? That is the color of apricot. Right and a rose that's just beautiful, right? Or, I, most recently, to look into my mother's face. She's 105 years old. She is transitioning, in, in the words of a hospice, at this moment. And yesterday, I went to see her because I knew I was leaving town. To look into that face is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You know, it's wise and ancient and completely unwrinkled. How she does it, I don't know, but completely unwrinkled. So, I mean, in other words, I think it's a point of view. I think it's, it's that there are, there's so much around us that's beautiful, even in, in the midst of the ugliness. And there's a lot of that, for sure. You know, um, but it's even more exciting to see beauty in the midst of the desert, you know what I mean? In the midst of an unforgiving, unyielding landscape where beauty just seems to grow, whether it's a kid or whether it's a tree um, or whether it's a flower. So uh, it's, it's just a part of the vocabulary of my life. Please forgive me for coming late, but I just had to be in your presence, and, and you're so generous with the way in which you share about your family, in which you share songs. 
and those are sacred things. And I wonder how you keep things for yourself, and, and what do you keep for yourself to sustain your work? So that's my wondering. Um, people ask me that question, and I guess I feel that there's so much I don't put out there. You know, so much more. Um, and I am very, very careful about, I think, about the boundaries for me of what's out there um, and about surrounding myself with the love of friends and family um, and adventures and art and lovely things that feed me and nourish me enough. Um, Sometimes I will come home and I will say things like, I left it all on the, I left it all on the floor, you know, like basketball. <laughs> you know, players do, right? I just left it all there. And I don't like that feeling. Um, and I also count on, if you heard me sit, sort of say, are you all with me? And that is because I count on your energy <laughs> to keep me going. You know, um, and uh, so I think that I don't feel as if usually I've exposed myself or made myself overly vulnerable. But I do, I do think it's important for a person in my position to model a way of communicating with people, to model a way of including people. Um, and I'm very aware of that responsibility. Um, and I think of it as, as a responsibility. And this has happened, you know, as I've matured. I remember when people used to say, you're my role model, and I would say, I'm not your role model. I'm much too young to be your role model. I don't want to be your role model. Look someplace else. And now, when someone says, you're my role model, I, I accept that. Okay. Okay. I've earned it. You've requested it. We can do this. So uh, I think that th this all, all that last that statement talks about is is this whole kind of that our work has developmental uh, a developmental trajectory, right? And so now I'm different from 20 years ago. It changes and evolves. And so the way I present today is different from the way I presented before. And what feels over, perhaps very open. Um, might have felt before too open, you know, that kind of thing. Hello. Um, so I have two questions. The first is um, I was thinking about the, the Bomb and Gilead song you sang and um, this idea of goodness. And I'm wondering in what ways does your own spirituality inform how you think about goodness? Um, and then the second question is that when I'm listening to you talk and reading some of the things that you write, there's such a lyrical nature to it. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what do you read? Um, so I was, I was thinking about Joy Harjo, uh, the intro and just her work. But what are you reading that informs the lyrical nature or just like you, I think when you took a break for, uh, to drink the water, you spoke some alliteration. So um, <laughs> I was like, oh, she's poeting. OK. Um, so what are you reading that informs that way of talking and, and writing and being? Um, I think the first question had to do with sort of spirituality and goodness. And I mean, I am. I, I don't like it when people say I'm a very spiritual person. You know. But I, 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 I am a, sort of a meditative, reflective um, person. And I, I do believe in um, a higher being. You know, I do. And I do in moments of, of, uh, of needing strength. I do pray. I do think that our work, the word that comes to me most, uh, when I think about the spiritual nature of the work, it's soulful. So I said, and this is big work. This is in 
intellectually discerning, methodologically rigorous work, right? This is relational work, and at some point I think I said this is soulful work. And that's where I think the spirituality comes in for me. I mean, if I'm, if I'm gathering that through the work, that's wonderful. Um, what do I read? I read Toni Morrison, right? I read, I, I am not, um, I read only, only fiction in the summertime. Um, what a break that is. So, and, and I, I tend to read women uh, authors, and I, and I read a lot of women of color, um, a lot. You know, so whether it's Caribbean, you know, whether it's Puerto Rican, I'm, I'm just very, very interested in, in these things. Um, but I've always loved language. And um, even as a kid, um, my role was as, as an observer, you know, and I kept a journal, which I still do, keep a journal. And it's not about um, my, you know, my romances or my love stories or my rejection or the bullying that I, I you know, what, it's not about that. They really are sort of just observing what's going on around me um, and trying to write that down. Um, so, I'm always, so I'm always working on my writing. Um, again, it's a discipline, and I'm writing something every day. Um, and I love language. Yeah. And my students will tell you that writing is very important to me. Their writing is very important to me. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I didn't collect myself. Um, when you talk about goodness and, and finding goodness, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about where exactly that goodness is? Like, is it inherently part of the people that occupy a kind of space or a system, or is their goodness to be found inherently in systems, particularly systems that we know to be largely problematic, like our educational system or other systems like that? That's an interesting question. I think I'm usually looking at goodness in people and in the things that people construct and design, right? Um, or in relationships among people. Um, rather than in particular systems. Um, and I'm often looking at goodness in the ways in which people challenge those very systems. Um, the tools they use, the approaches, the sources of the challenge, uh, the rigor of the challenge, the activism in relationship to it. So the ways in which people respond to structural inequality, for example. But also I think it's important to think about not just the response, but the ways in which people initiate, the sort of agency that each of us has. And it's, it's in kind of probing that agency and probing the imagination that often has to lead to the agency, right, to make something different, that you see uh, the threads of human goodness for sure, I, I would say. Um, I don't know why I, I, I'm thinking of this, but one of the books that I wrote is called Respect and, and Exploration. Um, and, it, and it tries to look at relationships of respect where there is some asymmetry that is a more powerful person respecting someone who is structurally in another place less powerful, right? So a teacher and a student, a physician and a patient, that kind of thing. 
And one of the, and, and there, it, it looks through the lens of six of the dimensions of respect that I gathered in doing portraits of these people in respectful relationships. But why, I don't know why this comes to me, but one of, one of my favorite dimensions of the six is curiosity. That if I am respectful of you, I'm genuinely curious about who you are, where you came from, how you got to be where you are. What are your dreams? What are your fears? What are your values? You know, um, and and there's a way in which curiosity, this burning curiosity, which I always have. I mean, I at the most boring dinner party, I will emerge from there not bored. Something about it that I'm curious about, right? And so, a burning curiosity that often leads me. To, to this place where goodness resides in people and in people's response to the institutions of which they are a part or which they're constructing. Um, I, I'll never forget going to a high school. The, this Respect is one of the books we talk about trying to speak to wider audiences. This book, Respect, has been read in colleges a lot and universities, but also high schools. And one of the places that actually my son graduated from something called Boston Arts Academy. And it's a, it's a high school for artists, for visual artists and musicians and theater people. And the year that Respect came out, they did an entire year on Respect. You know, people uh, doing rap songs, people doing dances, people, I mean, of each of these dimensions. So it, so that they then constructed it for themselves into this art. But I took, but I, I also went to an all black, very poor school in Philadelphia to talk about respect. And these kids had been forced to read the book. <laughs> Not just a chapter, the whole book, right, as they, you know, they told me. And um, <laughs> and after I spoke, it's a big, tall basketball player, always my favorite people in a student body, big, tall basketball player, who raised up his hand in the back. And he said, I have a question. Um, you talk about curiosity. What's the difference between curiosity, which you say is a sign of respect, and being nosy? Just being nosy, mm -hmm. and it was a it was a one. I, I told him he was brilliant. He said, "Tell that to my teachers." <laughs> but it was this wonderful moment because being nosy isn't the search for goodness mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. right? I often talk to my students in my research courses about making a distinction between being curious and voyeurism. And you know if you're, an, an, if you're a human being and if you're a researcher, you know when you've stepped over that line. And that's nosy. That's wrong. Um, Studs Terkel says it this way, I don't ask them anything that's none of my business. Right? That's disrespectful. Um, it's dehumanizing. Um, and it isn't the search. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have so many questions. I'll just, one of them is, I noticed all these beautiful words all throughout your, your talk with us tonight. Words like hope and curiosity and how you've paired them with other words like discipline. And, I, and I'm just like really, I'm drawn by this idea that these words that perhaps we often conceive of as things that you're just born with. Like you're born a hopeful person or you're born a curious person. I love this idea that I hear you saying that you can actually, you can nurture it and you can develop it. And I'm wondering if you can help us to see, give us an example of a moment or a few moments when you helped somebody else to develop that. Any one of these beautiful words to develop hope perhaps when they were hopeless 
or to nurture their curiosity um, towards goodness. Well, you know, the truth is, what immediately steps into my mind is how little kids are genuinely curious. I mean, it is school, primarily, that just, you know, rips it out of them, stomps it out of them. I mean, I'm, I'm so <coughs> impressed with my little five-year-old grandgirl, whose name is Holiday after Billy Holiday. And, you know, it's just, I, I'm exhausted at the end of a day with her because of the persistent questions and the curiosity about what's over there. And some of these things are very subtle. They're not big things that you would expect little people to take notice of. They're little things that you would expect big people to take notice of. And I, so I think in some ways the process for us as teachers and professors and researchers is somewhat, some, it, it isn't so much to inspire hope or curiosity. It is to help people shed that which has prohibited them from being essentially curious and hopeful in the first place. Um, uh, this is definitely true about truth telling. That, um, you know, how quickly kids learn the danger of telling the truth, right? And how my experience is, is that I have to work with people to get them to shed the fear or whatever that is, the, the prohibition that doesn't allow them to speak their mind and to tell the truth as they know it. Um, my, my son's wife, who's Haitian-American, and comes from a very different place than my son and me, right? I mean, it's a very different way of raising kids. It's a very different way of thinking of human development. It's a way, of, very different way of offering discipline and support and love, and we're all learning this. She asked me the other day, as we were talking about their daughter and troubles with school, she asked me, that, she said, Mom, how did you raise a son who thinks the only option is to tell the truth. And that said an enormous amount to me. Made me very proud. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you create an environment in which people will dare to hope and, and people will have the courage of their convictions and tell the truth? Um, I think, you know, I think it's more, it's more that than, than sort of growing it and developing it in people. Um, and I think that's so interesting for those of us who are teachers and are working in classrooms, whether it's at the level of the university or college or whether it's in, in high schools and grammar schools, that, that how do you create a classroom culture where people feel welcome to, um, to say, say their piece and to speak their mind and to give voice to what's troubling them. Um, how do you get um, the normal prohibitions of those spaces out of there to allow that to happen? Um, So you offered um, some pretty poignant questions that I thought were helpful in terms of when you're looking for something, how do you reframe what you're looking for by asking yourself, what is good here? What is strong? What is, I forgot the third one, but what is what? 
what is working. Thank you. And what is worthy. And what is worthy. So I'm thinking about um, people who are preparing to become teachers and in knowing that the teaching force is predominantly made up of white women and for those who choose to go into communities and teach where the children are overwhelmingly children of color, what additional resources would you suggest they engage with to pair with those questions so that when they're asking themselves those questions, their lens goes beyond the constructs that often perpetuate the oppression that we see so often in our schools? Well, I think that, I think that is a challenge both for pre-service training for teachers in which I think courses have to be invented that allow for this kind of conversation, for revelatory conversations about your own autobiographical journey and story and the kind of prejudices and biases and blind spots that that puts in your path that doesn't allow you to see people as strong and worthy who are different from you, um, doesn't allow you to conflate difference with dysfunction or identity with illness. Um, so I think that I don't, and it can take place in a whole bunch, in history courses, in sociology courses, in psychology courses, but there have to be these kind of difficult conversations that insists that people be interrogating their own bias and prejudice and parochialism. Because often it's parochialism, it's just not knowing. You know, it's, it, and, and so, I, and I think that somehow in schools this kind of conversation, inside schools, you can imagine it in, in faculty meetings, right? That there be some time too devoted to people problem solving about these questions as well. Um, I do think though that armed with just the question, what's good here? I do think that any ordinary goodwilled person will begin to see something different. It's not magical, but it is a different shift of lens and perspective and stance and perch, I think. Um, so, uh, so I think, I think that it, it, a lot of this is, is, again, I don't think it's, it's um, I mean, I think these are things that can be learned and developed um, and made real in, inside classrooms before other people get into classrooms. And then once you're in your classroom, there needs to be a continuing discourse and dialogue around these issues, around particular things of problem, of problem solving. And there is this question of vulnerability that came up earlier. There is the need to be, 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 allow yourself to be vulnerable in the midst of this and an environment that accepts this as the right way of being in this place, a safe way of being, you know, in this place. Um, uh, I, Deborah mentioned, um, a book that I wrote called The Essential Conversation, What Parents and Teachers Can Learn from One Another. Spent you know, years just watching the microcosm of this incredibly uh, loaded, often t anxious, difficult encounter between parents and teachers and what the, the macro forces that get loaded onto that around issues of power and racism and classism and gen all those kinds of things that can get loaded into a moment. And one of the things that was very successful for a number of these teachers who I talked to, many of whom were very good at this, was that the first conversation that they had with a parent, that is the October parent-teacher conference, was called a, li a listening conference. That they weren't, they didn't know the kids well enough by then to report out on who the kids were, but those parents, those caretakers, knew the kids very, very well, right? And so this was, this was advertised as a listening conversation. And even better, bring a story of your kid, right? And even better, bring a good story 
tell me about what he loves and what he's good at, you know, and what makes him happy, you know. And it just shifts the whole conversation right away because, first of all, teachers learn a lot about the child. But it also even forces parents not to come to the school with a deficit view of who their kids, kid is. You have, and, and I watched a conference where the parents said, well, I actually, I don't think he does anything good. And I, you know, the teacher said, that's impossible. That's just impossible. Let's go through the day and figure it out. And of course, there were lots of things that he did well, right? So, so that one of the things I think that some of these teachers can do is look to the other adults in children's lives who know them more, better and more deeply and who are their natural advocates in the world and are there, the reason they're there is to protect their child and to find out, to just mine those conversations, those listening conversations for that point of view of something good, something worthy, um, something strong. Uh, so I, I uh, heard your call to develop a socially just and humanistic, humanistic education and a uh, classroom that makes everyone in it uh, and, and around it visible. Um, however, oftentimes there's resist resistance to this kind of work, as we know, um, and supported by beliefs, particularly that students at early ages and aren't able to comprehend some of these really difficult and uh, hard, hard topics. And I was just, and I, you kind of touched on it a little bit about their resiliency and their strengths. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit about the need to have a socially just curriculum and socially just uh, and humanistic approach at even at the earliest ages um, of education and how important that is. Um, and then also, uh, what are some, if you could speak of some creative, you mentioned some creative ways of, of trying to deal with systemic like, injustices and oppression in our, in our school systems. So if you could just speak to maybe some creative, innovative ideas that you have as well in doing that. At five of six, this man comes with these two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I, I think it is especially important when kids are little to uh, have a curriculum and a pedagogy that embodies humanistic education. Right? And I say embodies on purpose. Because I think that most of the learning, even when you're grown up, is modeled. And when I think about even talking to you guys today, I'm wanting you to not only hear the message, but see me doing it, right? And 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 try to understand some of the subtext of why I'm up here in the first place, right? So I think that with little kids, it is carried in the body, in the gestures, in the attentiveness, in the respect, in the curiosity, in those kinds of things. Yes, it's, yes we want stories of Harriet Tubman. Yes, we want stories of Sojourner Truth. You know, we want all those stories and those stories, man, can be told to three-year-olds. I do it. Um, you know, the, these are these essential freedom stories. They can be told to the littlest kids who understand them absolutely. Um, and so we don't begin to study slavery in the seventh grade. You know, or or when you're sophomores. I mean, it's just and history well told as a story, is a narrative, a constructed narrative. So, so I just think it's very, very important to remember that little children have minds and souls and hearts and bodies that can absorb a lot, can learn a lot, and can give a lot in response. And um, this is often done, I think, through, through art, um, through theater, through music as well. I mean, that, that's it, that the more modalities you have at your disposal that you're willing to share, the better, I think, around that. 
Um, the second question, which has to do with dismantling structural inequality, inequality, something like that. I teach a course called The Ecology of Education. You, you know, that's a, that's a semester's worth, at least, of conversation. Um, but I'm always thinking that all that dismantling always comes from two directions, from the top and the bottom. And there's some way in which it and comes and, and dismantling comes as well from individual agency and institutional structural change. In other words, I'm interested in studying both of those things, the power and energy and activism uh, and discipline of individuals that make things change, and on the other hand, those aspects of the structure that are more or less welcoming and yielding to challenges to change, right? Um, and so I think, I think there's a lot that teachers can do collectively in a school to change the culture. And so I think the isolation of teachers in general in their classrooms and from one another is problematic, right? And I think, I do think that teachers need to begin to regard themselves as political animals um, who have the power to make change collectively and strategically. And so uh, I think, again, I think that something about teacher training needs to have teachers not as cogs in a large institutional structure, but as people with a voice and a vision and a moral stance with regard to the work that they're doing, which insist that they be politically strategic in getting stuff done. And it can't be done individually. That's why the word solidarity is so important here, right? Um, and then they need to hold various people who are making decisions above them accountable to that. I think, you know, you watch these striking Chicago teachers, you get excited. I do. You know, um, because they're grabbing the microphone. And I believe them when they say we're doing this for the children. Right? This isn't just about salaries. This is about educating Chicago's children. Um, but I think there's a way in which the educational establishment, and frankly, education schools and all of that, have not socialized students to think of themselves as political, moral beings um, who have the capacity to make change. Um, and again, I think that most change, I said it earlier, you know, is not going to be, it's not tomorrow. It, 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 it's incremental kind of change, chipping away at things rather than large, visible um, transformation that everyone can see. Um, and I think I was saying at the beginning that I'm very excited about young people, the kids, and about listening to the way they're bearing witness to what needs to happen whether it's gun control or climate, climate control, whatever it is. Um, and so it seems to me that part of the strategy needs to be listening to young people. I, I can't get over how deep conversations with both of my kids, and they're very different in every single possible way, and their friends. Um, I go away sort of it, it, it's blowing my mind. I mean, they're insights that I didn't have because they're, they're of a different generation and they, they have a different perspective on the cultural zeitgeist. You know? So this business about the alliances that might form <laughs> between teachers and students um, rather, than, um, rather than being adversarial or in opposition with one another as a source of some momentum 
for a change. That's the best I can do with the six o'clock hour. <laughs> This is my least favorite moment. I say it every time, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. So I want to just have everybody join me in thanking you for all that you've given us today. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.